then I'll be rolling. Cool. Okay, so my name is Adam Swaha. I'm with the OC Weekly right now, um, and I'm a reporter. Um, and uh, Dylan here asked me to do a, a talk about fake news. Um, are you guys, you guys are familiar with the term fake news? Have you heard our insane president? Sorry if you like him, but our insane president used that phrase? Yeah. Fake news? Yeah? What does fake news mean to you guys as you know it right now, if you've heard of it? Clickbait. Okay. Yeah, yeah, totally. Propaganda. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Okay, cool. Yeah, so those are all part of it, because it turns out that the phrase is actually extremely like complex and convoluted. It doesn't mean just one thing. Like, depending on who's using the term, it means something completely differently. Uh, yeah, so it's fake news and the importance of being an active media consumer, which clickbait and propaganda are both a part of that. So I wanted to start with Mark Zuckerberg because Facebook right now is like in this sort of crisis because of the election. Um, people are saying that the Russians specifically meddled in Facebook and promoted fake news. and. Um, People thought that it was real, obviously, and they sent it around to each other and it promoted ideas that were false and not true. Um, so in an interview, he said that there's three different types of fake news. This is from Mark Zuckerberg, the head of uh, Facebook. He said there's spammers, that there's people that write fake news articles uh, to get clicks, basically, like you were saying. Um, so that more clicks and ad views equals more money. So they're just trying to make money like all corporations. Um, and then the second one was coming from state actors. In our uh, current context, it's Russia. So um, different countries can promote basically the use of fake news. So the one that's really important right now is people are, like I said before, are saying that the Russian government specifically and people within Russia promoted false information during the uh, latest election that just happened. Um, and then the third one that Mark Zuckerberg references is Real media, which what he considers real media is like um, the New York Times, the Atlantic, Washington Post, like really big newspapers, LA Times, um, Orange County Register would be one of those too, locally. Um, and what he's saying that what they're doing is they're promoting news or they're publishing articles that they, the writer and the editors think are true, but in reality aren't true. So we're gonna go into that later because I think it's really important. Um, but yeah, and then this is a photo I took from an article that is of what is called like a troll farm, which is basically a room that probably looks exactly like this, but there's a bunch of computers in it, and people type BS articles and then send them all over the place. Facebook is a really popular place because it's easy to send an article around to Facebook very, very quickly. Um, if anybody is interested and has questions, yell them out, I don't care, and we'll talk about any ideas you guys have. Um, so, Second thing I want to talk about uh, is how Donald Trump and people like Donald Trump use the term fake news. Uh, Donald Trump basically uses it whenever he wants and however he wants. So he doesn't have a strict definition of the phrase. He uses it when he's unhappy with what he's hearing. And he's not the only person doing this. So people do this all over the world and a lot of world leaders. So in this photo here we have Donald Trump, you can all boo at once if you want to. Ooh. There you go, nice, thank you. <laughs> okay, and then you can, no, don't boo with this guy, but this is the Prime Minister of Israel. And so the importance of this is, you guys have heard that Donald Trump is in, people think that he's like a corrupt leader. You guys, have you heard that phrase used to, about Donald Trump? That he's involved with making money in ways that are illegal, and it's impacting his presidency and how he is the president. So it turns out, Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister of, of Israel, is having the same issue right now, specifically centered around media and corruption through media, um, money being exchanged for positive um, coverage. And the reason that this is important for our talk about fake news is because Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel started using that phrase, fake news, when people talk to him about IEDs he doesn't like. So when reporters come to him and say, hey, you heard that you're really corrupt, you're making money in ways you shouldn't be using, and shouldn't be, his response is, that's fake news, which sounds a lot like our con president over here. And he's clear across the world, in a different context, completely. And he's taken up the same thing. You can hear Congress people, senators, you can hear normal people use the word fake news. Typically, it's people that agree with his world perspective, oftentimes. Um, so like I said here, it has global implications. There's also been, in Malaysia, they passed a bill in parliament 
making fake news and the spreading of fake news actually illegal. So if you were to post an article that was incorrect in the government's eyes, you can be sentenced to six, up to six years in prison, which is insane if you think about that. That's and right? yes, it is censorship. And part of the reason that's a problem, as we've already described, is that these two people, oh, wrong slide, Donald Trump, Netanyahu, and Mark Zuckerberg all have completely different definitions of the same word. And that's important if you're going to put people in prison to use the same definition. So it's easy for everybody to understand the, 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 like where, what they're operating off of. So this is a picture from Malaysia, and it's uh, probably what looks like in a bus station or train station or something. It says, sharing a lie makes you a liar, which maybe, it might, it might be more complicated than that probably is, but it definitely shouldn't get you in prison. Um, so the way that they uh, describe um, the law is, it's news, information, and data reports which are wholly or partly false. So that's a very broad definition. So let's think about Malaysia in the United States. This, this quote in the context of the country we live in. The country that we live in, he talks poorly about many different people in the country. The problem with the Malaysian law is, if we had that law here, Donald Trump would hear something he doesn't like, call it fake news, and then through a legal process, put that person or entity in, in prison potentially. So that shows you how important this sort of topic is, generally, and not just here, but, it, but it across the world. So, okay, so, and honestly, my opinions about politics and the world will show through in this presentation, but I'll explain to you why I personally think that's not a bad idea, or that's not a problem, and why it's important in the context of the idea of fake news. That's something I'm gonna talk about later on. And actually, right now, as this slide shows. So, um, what I put right here was that when trying to think about the idea of fake news, be aware of political motives. So what that basically means is kind of like what I was talking about before. If you hear somebody say the word fake news, think about why that word is being used. Is it being used because they don't like the idea that you're telling them that they're hearing? Or is it something more legitimate than that? Um, so uh, I also put, why would Democrats be interested in addressing the phrase fake news? Why, uh, what about Republicans? So we already talked about Republicans. Oftentimes it's, it's to support the president and it's to support ideas that they don't like. The reason that Democrats often talk about fake news is because it's the only way that they can kind of understand how they lost the election and it, it fundamentally changes the way that like, they perceive um, the legitimacy of democracy, like how we vote and how we make decisions. They think it is undermining that process. But I think through my research and readings, a uh, big part of it is nobody understands how he became president, and they use the, the idea of fake news as a way to explain how the president became uh, our president. So over here I have these pictures, or these screenshots, from two different articles. Or actually, it's the same topic, two different articles. This is from Gawker, this is from The Intercept. Um, if you're a news nerd or a, a media nerd, you, you could have very strong opinions about both of these uh, publications, and that's fine, uh, especially for what we're talking about. So do you guys remember what happened in Florida some time ago in 2016 when the man shot up the nightclub in Florida? Pulse. Yeah, Pulse nightclub shooting. Do you guys know about this or have you heard about this? Yeah. So uh, the reason I'm talking about this is because anytime that there's like a major traumatic incident in the country, reporters, go to the scene and try to report and figure out what's happening as fast as possible. Um, in that process, in the need for the speed to get the content uh, out to the people, a lot of mistakes are made and really important things are missed in the process. So if you guys did something wrong, right, at your house or wherever you were, and somebody came up to you and was like, hey, what happened? And you told them something, and you were really flustered and caught up in the moment because there's people all around, there's stuff going on. There's a possibility that you would not tell them the correct thing, or the reporter reporting or reporting what's going on would tell would report an incorrect thing, right? Those things get published onto the internet and into newspapers and are considered facts and factual. So this goes on, this goes back to at the very beginning, Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook talking about the idea of fake news through real media which is people that are just doing their jobs just happen to get it wrong, and it has big implications on people's lives. So in the Pulse nightclub shooting, it was a gay club that was shot at, and the man was a Muslim. So 
reporters and people put this, this like thought through that the reason that he picked Pulse nightclub was because it was, it was a, gay, a place where gay people got together and he, based off of his like radical religious beliefs, thought that was a place worth harming as a way to show that his faith and him don't believe in uh, homosexuality, essentially. So that, as time went on, it was, that was reported all over the place. Everybody thought this was true, and you can look through all the different publications in the Times 2016, and everybody's basically saying that. It turns out that's exactly wrong. And they're founding that out a lot now, but that the situation was far more complicated than that. This person who did the shooting did a horrendous, horrible thing, obviously, right? But his main thing that he wanted to do was actually attack, attack Disney World. But he couldn't because there was too much security around Disney World. He wanted to choose Disney World because it was a place that would have a very large impact and scare a lot of people. It would terrorize a lot of people. The reason he ended up at Pulse was that when he was leaving, he was looked up on his phone. His idea was, I'm going to do this horrible thing at Disney World. I can't do it there. So my next thing is a nightclub. So he typed in his phone, nightclub in his area. The first nightclub that showed up was Pulse, which happened to be a gay club. They're not clear if he has any hard feelings against gay people, but he did want to scare the hell out of a lot of people, and he did do that. He did a horrible thing. But it changes the dynamic of how we view the person. It changes the story. So, in your guys' opinion, is this fake news, the fact that they reported the wrong thing, or is it just a normal reporting error? Like, how do you view that? Do you see it as somebody like pushing the wrong ideas or just making a mistake? Like, to you guys, how do you see that? I think it was like a, like a headline that would meant to catch attention. Totally. And why, why, why do you think that idea would catch attention? Because it's, it's the wrong thing to do, right? So yeah. It's, it's like the answer to what happened. So totally. people are going to read that and be like, oh, okay, so that's why that person did that. Totally. Yeah. So it, it's a way to make a really complicated, horrible thing pretty easy to understand. Wow, thank you so much. That's good. Yeah, so it's, it's an easy way, or yeah, it's an easy way to make a complicated thing easy to understand. Where the reality of the situation is it's far more complicated. His father was actually an FBI informant and didn't like the United States for a lot of his own reasons. So they're, they're wondering if his father was involved in the thing, even though they tried to charge and uh, uh, put his wife up on trial, and they acquitted her, she, which for a terror charge is insane. But that's beside the point. But my point for bringing up this situation is, this is a very intense situation. It is very, in, it's very topical. It's a thing that we hear a lot about now, terrorism and those sorts of things. And these massive publications um, just fell on their face and got it completely wrong. And this actually has happened a ton of times throughout history. So this brings it back to the idea of fake news. Like why is fake news a thing that we talk about if this is a thing that has occurred throughout time basically since uh, journalism is existed. And it's basically just because it's a phrase that a certain person, i.e. the president, really likes to use. That's why it's become a thing. And then there's two different motives, which is him using it when he doesn't like what's going on, and then it's a way for people that don't like him to understand how we got to where we are politically. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna talk about a thing that I wrote about, which happened here at the library that you guys are working at. Um, so here's a physical copy of it. You can pass it around or look at it. You can do whatever you want with that. So that's the article in the OC Weekly where I report. Um, the reason that I am bringing that up is for two reasons. One of them is this person that I'm highlighting, Clark Sharon, sat in the front room here silently for a very long time. And I think there's sort of a beauty in the idea of a person that like did a very interesting thing, was a journalist for you know, 30 years at the LA Times and OST Register, and now is homeless, fell on hard luck, and like spends his time here in the same place that you guys are spending time. And there's something, yeah, to me I think that's like, there is, is interesting about that. Um, so but the reason besides that is that in, when this article went up, it went around the internet through Facebook, through social media, which I did not expect at all. Um, and what arose from that was another publication wrote about my publication through the OC Weekly. When they wrote about that publication, they basically, and this is not to talk orally about, I blocked your name, this person, because that can sound really petty, it's not what I'm trying to do. Uh, what, they, what they did was, they basically copied and pasted from my article, 
put it on here. If you look at the article, it's way thinner written. And they kept calling the OC Weekly, where I work, um, the OC Register. So they kept calling the publication the wrong publication. And there's a problem in that because if your job is to report facts and you're going to take ideas from another place, which is what everybody does, you need to slow down and take the time to actually do it the right way and research these things. Um, and this just happened to impact, or not impact, but like had to do with me and it had to do with the library and the place that we are right now. Um, so it's also important for a bigger reason, which is um, the idea of Journalism and media and media consumption, how we engage with media, how we read things, um, the speed at which we do that is really important. So you brought up social media earlier, and social media is a place where you can look at a headline, never even open the article up, but then repost it yourself, because you think this part of the article looks really interesting, and it might look really interesting. Um, the problem with that is people aren't reading the body of it, they're just reading like one sentence, and the, the, the headlines are often very misleading. But if you actually take the time to read the article, um, the way that you engage with posts online is not the way that you guys like read books at school or read things you're actually interested in. Interested in. You basically read the first few paragraphs and then you move on because it's not the type of place, Facebook isn't the type of place where you really engage with something. So when you guys are in class, when you guys are talking about a book that you're reading or whatever, the teacher will ask you like, hey, what does this specific chapter mean? Doesn't the teacher say things like that? Like, what is the major plot point of this story? What is the narrative structure like? All those things that like make the reading of the thing actually interesting. Like the storytelling, the parts that you guys like as you're reading a story when you're watching a movie, those things get lost when media is, oftentimes, when media is consumed in this sort of fashion. It's read sort of as a way to pick up raw information and move on. It's not a way you guys are engaging with the thing. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, does, the way, does the fact that people only read the headline and not read the body, does that affect the way um, you know, like article writers write their headlines and maybe the first two paragraphs? Totally. So, yes, yes, the answer is yes. But also, before the internet, in when we just have newspapers or magazines or zines or whatever uh, medium that you're looking at, um, they still did that. Because we, when you're looking at like a newspaper, you know, a newspaper is not just one article where you can only read one thing. A newspaper has many different articles. So they're still trying to grab your attention in that moment as well. So the basic concept that is used in social media already existed. It's just, it's just like engaged with differently on social media. Does that make sense? Um, so I think my main point with this in terms of like fake news, how do you engage with fake news? How do we combat the idea of fake news? Like if it's a problem, and we all probably think that it's a problem, like how do we stop it from actually impacting us? And my biggest thing that I think that I was I thought about this topic is basically on every angle is the speed at which you're consuming things. Basically just slow down. So like if you're in my shoes and you're I don't know, and as a writer, like, the way that I think about topics, the way that I research my topics, when I go down and do interviews with people, is to like slow down, take in all the information, and try to look at everything from all angles. As a consumer, which you, everybody in this room is, including me, you should do that same thing. Like, never take one thing that you're writing or reading as the sort of like the law. So like, if you see an article that says, um, Donald Trump is thrown in jail right now. Like that, some people would get really mad at that article, some people would get really happy about that article, but we all know that article would fly, or if it was from a sort of reputable source, would fly around Facebook because it, it, has a, it has a resonance with people. People care about that idea on both sides, right? So if you see a headline like that or something along those lines, click on it, see if, if it actually interests you, start to read it, and if the thing looks like, you know when you're in class and you don't have time to write your paper, but you still have to turn it in, and you BS it, and you only put three lines down, and it looks like hell, and you don't, and like, you don't like it, the teacher doesn't like it, you will read articles that look like that too. And if you see those articles, and you think, man, that looks like I wrote it when I was in a rush, probably don't consider it. Or if you do, look for important things like, 
hints in the text. Like, you'll see, like, uh, so-and-so said this thing, or they referenced a different article. There will be links oftentimes, there should be, in those articles. Click on those links in the articles and kind of follow it down that rabbit hole. Like, you guys have gone on Wikipedia, I'm guessing, right? Like, everybody goes on Wikipedia. Have you ever spent, like, an app now, no Wikipedia? You gotta check it out, it's really cool. But it has everything on it. And so, you can, I've gone on Wikipedia, and you'll start on one page, and then you'll spend four hours just like reading random stuff that doesn't have anything to do with each other because you're going down like a rabbit hole of links. You're clicking on links and you're like reading and following things. So you can end up, start talking about homelessness over here and then over here you're like reading a thing about like why steps in front of a building are designed the way that they are. Like those things don't seem like they have anything to do with each other, but in reality they really do and it can take you three hours to go from here to here but Wikipedia allows you to do that, waste your time in that sort of way. Um, but the point of what I'm saying is that the idea of researching the things that you're reading and engaging with the things that you're reading like slowly and with, um, with purpose is really important. And it's a way that you guys will like read things, A, that you actually enjoy, B, it's so you won't get like bad ideas in your head. So there was a guy during the election, he was talking to me and we were just talking casually about politics. And he was saying something like, well, I know I'm not going to vote for Hillary because at least nobody said she might have killed somebody. And I was thinking, what? What are you talking about? It turned out there was a fake news article, this is a real one, that said that Hillary Clinton was involved in the murder of somebody to cover something up, right? That wasn't true. But this guy that I was talking to knew that it wasn't true, but still used it as a way to formulate his own opinion about another person. And my hunch about that is that he already didn't like her, and he saw a thing very quickly that agreed with how he feels, so confirmation bias, like you seek things out that, that agree with the way that you feel. And that's what he did, but the difference was that he was felt okay to talk to me about it even though we all knew it was totally not true. Which shows you why a thing like fake news is important, and it's important to think about. Because you guys want to go through the world talk to people, make decisions with the correct information. You don't want to feel like somebody's screwing you over just because you were just kicking around Facebook for a little bit and saw the wrong thing. You know what I mean? This is, and you probably will all be psyched on this, my last slide. Um, and so the basic point of this is, just like it says, get your media from, from places all over the world, get your media from a variety of sources, um, and People will say that partisanship, which is like having really strong political, political opinions is bad. Um, I don't think that that's true. And I think a lot of people don't think that's true. And I think the reason that that isn't true is all of these media organizations that I have here all have like a very strong opinion. And I'll point out the opinions and I'll explain to you why they're doing really good work and why I think things like this are good to look at. So um, RT is one, if you're a media nerd, you're probably told to not like because it comes from Russia and it's got money from the Russian government, right? The reason that RT is actually interesting, not that you should believe everything you read in RT, is because they create a space where people from the United States that have alternative opinions can go on there and they can have those opinions heard. So you don't have to agree with them, but it's kind of interesting to, sometimes to like see stuff that doesn't automatically come to your mind when you're thinking about issues. Telesur is very similar. Telesur is a Latin American pub publication online that has funding from Venezuela and a bunch of other countries, so it's government funded as well. Um, and they do a lot of re really interesting um, things that have to do with uh, just different Latin American issues. Um, Reason is a really prominent libertarian publication. The Venezuela Analysis is another Venezuelan thing. Uh, they have a pretty leftward bent. Uh, BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed is a place known for creating clickbait like content, which is like 20 reasons you should break up with your terrible boyfriend or anything along those lines or whatever type of nonsense thing like that. But they also on Instagram, which I'm sure you guys have, they uh, have a thing where on the stories on Instagram, they will go through basically and debunk different fake news articles of the day. So anything that their reporters have scoured and said, hey, this is really popular, but it um, isn't true, they'll do like a quiz and they'll make it kind of fun, I guess. And um, so they'll basically ask you like, do you think this is real or not, give you a couple seconds to tell you if it is or not. 
And it's interesting because BuzzFeed is a place that's known for creating clickbait, which people think has to do with the spread of fake news, which to some degree is true, um, but they're like actively trying to fight against it in a popular, fun way. Um, Social Europe is, uh, they deal with a lot of European issues, economic stuff, a lot of really interesting things that we talk about in the United States, they talk about in a different way. This is like the left-wing version of Reason, it's a really popular left-wing publication, and Al Jazeera deals with um, different Middle Eastern issues and is a really reputable news source. Um, all of these are really prominent publications and they're part of the media world, but um, are kind of like on the fringes more or less. I didn't include like New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and all those types of things because like those are things that like you guys hear about all the time. And to think that a publication of that stature doesn't have a political opinion is completely false. So even though things may seem like things you've heard before, it's still a political belief that's backing those sorts of uh, things. Even the things that seem like um, completely apolitical or non-political still in reality pretty much are. So you said that fake news got really popular because Donald Trump was using it a lot, right? Yes, yes. But do you think or do you know if um, the spread of fake news like this was used in previous elections and maybe like to the same extent? Okay, yeah, totally. So that's actually a really good, interesting question. So the, the phrase, the term fake news is new. That phrase in itself is basically new. What is being talked about behind the idea of fake news has literally been going on forever. So the reason that I brought up these uh, publications at the very end, actually, which is, I didn't bring it up, but it's important, uh, is so the idea of like another country influencing our elections and us getting mad about that, that's the thing that is a problem, right? For a country to inter intervene in another country's politics is a big deal. So if it did happen legitimately, that's bad. That is the wrong thing to do. But if you are to read publications like, and this is why I put them on here, is it like, and they all come at this from different political perspectives, which is why I included it. Reason and Jacobin, and Venezuela analysis, Telesur especially, RT, will all talk about ways globally the United States has interfered in elections. So we've interfered, if you can think of an important country around the world, in our history, the United States probably intervened in the elections by doing the same exact thing we, that we think Russia did to us. So spreading misinformation. A big reason that I included two things that have to do with Venezuela is because Ven the Venezuela issue is really important, and the way that it is talked about in the United States is from a very American-specific perspective. There is a crisis going on in Venezuela, no doubt. Nobody can say that there isn't. People don't have food, people are dying, going hungry. There's like riots in the street. It's insane what's going on. But why it is happening, how they got there, and how they're expected to get out of that situation, you can read all of these different publications and they will all have different reasons for that. And that's good, like differing opinions is good. You shouldn't all, like all of us in the room shouldn't agree with the same thing. In reality, I will say bad things about Donald Trump, but if everybody in this room agreed with me, I would think it was cool. But it's good also to disagree with me. You know what I mean? And it really is not with Donald Trump actually, but with other things that we will talk about. Um, so, um, yeah, so the, 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 along the lines of what you were saying is, um, these different publications will show how us, the United States, have gone to other countries and done the, the very thing that we're mad at Ru uh, Russia doing to us. Which is why, if you are to read Social Europe or any of these places from a European perspective, especially a Middle Eastern perspective, we've destroyed countries in the Middle East. And that's like not like a fact, or a, it's in a fact. It's not an opinion that I hold, it's like a fact of like nature at this point, really. Um, and, and, and Al Jazeera is a pretty moderate publication, but they would talk, be more likely to talk about it. But not our press. Jacobin will as well, definitely tell us or Jacobin. Um, so you can look at, if you, honestly, if you like, a, a, a country people like to look at a lot is uh, Chile. Um, there was a leader in Chile that was, there was a coup in Chile and with the help of the United States um, and with professors from the University of Chicago, which is a very prominent university that some of you may want to go to college at, which is a good college. Um, professors from there and our government at the time helped basically depose, kill, destroy uh, the, the democratically elected Salvador, uh, elected leader named Salvador Allende. 
So that's a piece of our history that an American press we're probably not likely to hear about, but sure as hell, Telesur is going to talk about it. And they're going to have a political bent and reason why they're talking about it, but it's still good that you guys have different information. And um, a lot of these publications um, will do things like, obviously, they speak Spanish, they speak Russian, they speak Arabic in a variety of other languages, like some of them are in English. So you can get kind of whatever you want from a global perspective, and that's good. And I think, in reality, that's the kind of stuff, reading things that maybe you don't agree with, um, that you do agree with is going to fight the idea of fake news. So if we think fake news is a problem, which we all, I think, do, reading different things that seem even crazy at first but are verifiable and backed up with history and facts. Like, you'll read about stuff, so for instance, like in Chile, that I was talking about, you'll think, this can't be true. It cannot be true that the United States helped destroy and kill the president of another country. That can po possibly can never have happened. And there was plenty of academic research and there's plenty of historical accounts of this actually happening. So it's not like to bash the United States just to bash the United States, but it's important when you're hearing things to understand a global context and perspective, especially given where we live. We live in a very diverse place. We should be in taking diverse news and media too. It shouldn't just be from the same three different places. Probably where people work there all went to really fancy schools and came from a lot of money so if you think those people don't have some like political views that are all very similar, they do, because they come from the same fancy places, basically, um, with similar ideologies. I'm, I'm working uh, with the OC Weekly, reporting for OC Weekly right now. Um, people will say that the OC Weekly is biased, and I think there's some truth to that in the sense that every reporter is biased. So if you're, my job is to go to a specific place, right, and to say like, hey, what the hell's going on here? How do we, like, um, who am I gonna interview? Am I gonna interview, so you go to a robbery or something. If you choose to initially, or this is better, you go to a protest, right? You go to a protest, and there's a lot of them that go on right now. If your immediate thing is, you walk up to the cop and you go, hey man, you look like you're sweating, like you've been doing, like you've been like pushing people around, it's been hard, they've been pretty rowdy. And they go, yeah, yeah, man, they're totally true. It's like, oh, can I get some quotes from you? And you're interviewing the police officer. Your decision to initially go to the police officer as opposed to going to the protester, right? That decision to interview the person with authority as opposed to not go to the person without the power is, like, can be considered, it's a, it's a bias. Does that make sense? You're appealing to authority, and you're not appealing to the person that is lacking power. So a good reporter, ideally, would go to the cop, talk to the cop, and then would go to the protester too, and get both sides of the story, put that story together, and create a piece that like feels unbiased, right? But a lot of publications don't always do that. The ideal is to do that thing, which is to get both sides. Getting both sides is really important. And that's like a way that you can tell are you reading a legitimate thing or not. So if you just hear one complete side of a story and you think like, man, that like felt good because I agreed with it, but I basically was just like being told the things I already knew the entire time, that's probably oftentimes not a good sign. Like sometimes it can be fine because that's reading for pleasure to some degree. You can read serious stuff for pleasure and um, you can, yeah, you can read serious things for pleasure and it can be biased more or less. But to way, a way to figure out what a thing is in bias is to see if you hear both sides. Um, OC Weekly, to answer your question, uh, Voice of OC, I always flip the words around, but uh, Voice of OC is really good too. Honestly, LA Times has a few reporters left in Orange County Bureau, and their, their publication is incredible, of course. If a thing happens that's really insane, like you can keep people all over the world, or not, yeah, well, but all over the country will write about it. Um, so, but I think getting a local perspective is really good. Um, I'm trying to think. The Register is a really good, reputable source. Um, people will say that it skews conservatively. And um, some of the reporters do, and some of the reporters do not. And a time when you're reading a publication, if you think, like, that sounded like a lot of opinions, look to see if it's an op-ed. So it could be a thing that's a pure, pure opinion piece, and they're not making any bones about it. They're basically saying, like, I'm really interested in homelessness, and I'm going to write a piece that's my opinion, my take about homelessness. And there can be a lot of like important good things going on there, but it's still opinion based. But a good opinion is backed with real information, so you're allowed to write opinion, be an opinionated person, as long as you have like ways to back up what you're saying. 
Like if you're with friends and you just say something completely crazy against somebody else, like, man, you were such a jerk to that person. Like, why did you do that? You have no reason to back it up. You look bad. You're the one that looks bad. But if you can say like, well, they're terrible in these different ways, they'll probably agree with you and think it's okay. Like that's how you should view the, the reading and media that you're consuming at the time as well. Um, is you want to be able to verify those things. And the reporters um, go through a lot of work to like, they should go through a lot of work to put like sources and they should put facts and links to different things they're talking about as a way for you to verify if it's true or not. So if you are interested in something you read, like click on the link, go through, see if it seems true. Because people will oftentimes put things that benefits their article and they're completely taking things out of context. And that could be, like we were saying, like um, the king of the world, Mark Zuckerberg was saying, right here, this thing where it's a real media institution, but they're skewing with their information that they have to benefit themselves in their article. I, am, I try to practice what I preach, so I consume really slow media. So most of the things that I read are like books, and I read like, I try to read like, are you guys, is anybody in college? Yeah, you guys are in college? Okay, yeah? Okay, so have you, have they shown you like how to use the library at school? I know you're like working in the library, but have they showed you how to use your school library? Yeah. Have, have you heard of the thing called JSTOR, that website? Did they ever tell you about that? Oh yeah, like some kid, some guy was talking about something. Yeah, so JSTOR is like where all of the academic articles are in one place. And you have, the, the cool thing about being a student if you're a dork like me, I guess, is that you have access to all those journal articles. So if you're interested in a topic, whatever that topic is, go look for academic articles because those are honestly the best things that you could ever read are academic articles. They're really boring and they're really, really dry, some of them, but they can be really interesting if you're interested in the topic. So if you want to learn real information and miss things that reporters don't talk about, read books and read academic articles because Anything that takes a long time to, um, to consume, most people aren't gonna do it, but that's where you get like, good information. And that's how you know your information is true. Because if you're gonna write something that's not true, are you gonna write a thousand page book about it? Or are you gonna write you know, a 300 word uh, web article about it? You're gonna write a web article. You're not gonna write a book, it's too hard. And you don't make any money writing books. So, um, yeah, I, so for me, I mostly just try to, I read news articles when I need to, but I mostly try to read books and I really like reading academic articles because it helps you get like what seem like new ideas. So, okay, for instance, the way that I, Clark Sharon, the guy that I wrote about uh, that was in the library, I found him because I was digging through articles with Dylan in the history room. And I was researching an uh, um, old police chief from Santa Ana named Ray Davis from the 70s. Um, he basically made Santa Ana in the 70s the first like sanctuary city in the country where his police officers would not work with immigration to deport people. So he's the first person in the 1970s to do this. It's a big deal. So I, I was looking through old um, uh, LA Times articles about this and I saw somebody's name who wrote it, Clark Sharon, and Dylan goes, hey man, Clark Sharon who wrote that article in 1976 is outside. So I met this person through digging through stuff in this library, through digging through stuff that takes an eternity to go through. As you guys probably know for like working here, that stuff is buried, it's hard to find, but there's good stuff in there and it's worth it. Um, so basically, yeah, just like take your time. And taking, doing things slowly, if you like making music, if you like making any art, like art takes time. To get good at anything takes a lot of time. And that's good, you know? And it helps you avoid bad information and fake news. That's, I think, the biggest way we're gonna get out of this whole thing, is if people just slow down, if publications slow down, if consumers slow down, and we don't reinforce uh, the creation of really fast-paced media. And it's hard, because there's money to be made, but I think it's you know, worthwhile. So, I did say a lot of opinions up here, as you guys know. I try my best to research the things that I talk about, so I think it's fine to be opinionated. Um, and I think you guys should all be opinionated and form really strong opinions, but don't just form them for no reason. Like form them because you care about something, you know? You can say something kind of insane, but if you like know why you're saying what you're saying, 
and you know that it's you're being good to other people and you're like being true to yourself, those things are all good. You know, it's a good way to form opinions. Yeah. Cool. Thank, Thank you so much you guys Thank for coming. Oh, you probably don't, but if you want to email me for whatever reason, if you have any questions, or you're interested in journalism, or politics, or anything, feel free to email me, and I will chat with you. <laughs>